All right. So uh, my name is Jeff Toffley. I am Clarify's senior technical writer, and I'll be one of the speakers today. And I'll be joined by Trey Pierce, uh, Clarify's solution lead. Uh, today's agenda includes uh, discussion uh, about region classification and single classification workflows. Uh, we're going to have a demonstrative uh, demonstration of automated automated data labeling technology, and uh, so the, a live demo and a Q and A session. Uh, as a little housekeeping, uh, before we get started, um, everyone will be placed on mute, uh, but we would love to hear from you. So please provide any feedback and questions through the chat box, and we'll answer your questions after the presentation, which should take about 35 minutes. Um, also, today's webinar will be recorded and will be sent to all the attendees and registrants early next week. All right, the next slide. <clears throat> okay, so just a little bit of background uh, information about Clarify before we get started. Uh, Clarify is the leading independent provider of artificial intelligence for unstructured image and video data. Uh, we offer an end-to-end -end computer vision and natural language processing platform that covers the entire AI lifecycle, um, from data labeling and training all the way through model development and deployment. Uh, Clarify has won numerous awards. Um, and is recognized by Forrester as a leader in, the, uh, in computer vision platforms and is the only startup listed alongside companies uh, like Google and Microsoft in the space. Uh, the company was founded in 2013 by our CEO, Matt Zeeler, PhD, and established leader in the field of machine learning and computer vision uh, after winning the top five places at, in, at ImageNet. <laughs> And uh, Clarify continues to grow with over 70 employees at our headquarters in New York City, offer our offices in San Francisco, DC, and Tallinn, Estonia. And we believe we offer a unique perspective as one of the earliest movers in the AI space and offer a ton of practical experience working with AI solutions in the enterprise. And I'd like to introduce some of the common challenges uh, faced by our customers. And then Trey will walk you through a specific use case that shows how automated data labeling and model specialization address these issues. Um, so to begin with, um, AI is maturing and uh, more and more public data sets and model architectures are becoming available. Um, and at Clarify, we have many of our own general purpose models that we've developed in-house and tested in-house. Um, but there remains a large gap between the capabilities of general purpose models and the unique domain challenges faced by most businesses. So that is to say the general purpose models are limited and typically are not themselves a business solution. Next slide. So how does one create domain-specific AI? Um, how does one create visual and text recognition tools capable of understanding unique business problems? Uh, well, this requires the training of custom models, and these custom models require training data that represents the type of data the models will see in the real world. And so the, it's the creation of this training data remains a significant bottleneck in the AI production process. Uh, next slide, Trey. And so how is this done now? How is training data created? Well, too often people with advanced degrees in machine learning and mathematics spend too much of their time manually labeling data sets. And this lack of automation results in extended project timelines and wastes of uh, frankly valuable and costly resources in the form of data scientist time. Um, so at this point, uh, I would like to introduce Trey Pierce, who's going to show us how to address these challenges uh, by using automated data labeling to speed model development. Thank you, Jeff. And I hope everyone's able to hear me and still able to see the presentation. I saw somebody in the, the chat saying that they're not able to see the presentation. Uh, I hope everyone else is able to. If you're not able to see it, just maybe drop off and try refreshing the screen. We got some assistance uh, from our end that's trying to help you, Thomas. But anyway, I'm going to jump right in here, uh, segue from what Jeff was saying. Um, 
And certainly, it seems like uh, the days of uh, pre-built models being all that's available for deep learning, especially computer vision and NLP, um, is past us and we're moving towards a world where everybody wants exactly the model that um, does exactly what they want it to do within their business use case. And uh, while all of the, uh, like he said, data sets and the skill sets are more widely available than they've ever been um, before, the data labeling part is still really, really where the bottleneck is. So it seems the name of the game today is trying to make use as much as possible of pre-built models, these robust big models trained over big data sets as a starting point. So you don't actually have to start from scratch, leverage that knowledge and distill it further into some exact um, bespoke model that's specific to your business use case. We refer to this process um, that we do frequently, right? Um, being kind of AI specialist here at Clarify, we refer to this process as kind of model specialization. So um, taking something like a pre-built robust people detector that knows people generally and then specifying it in something that can detect something like soldiers or workers or policemen, something we might consider a specialist model or instead of just a regular vehicle, tanks, excavators and ambulances, we kind of um, view this as its own set of unique uh, techniques and capabilities. Um, this process relies primarily on this idea of these pre-trained models that we provide. There's um, a whole diverse kind of gallery that we have, and unfortunately, I don't won't really have time within this webinar here to to go into all the different um, amazing ones that we have. Um, you can check out the model gallery. I think I'll be able to show you where you can go to see some of this in a bit. But suffice it to say, we have you know a number of pre-built that do things at a very good, generalized, uh, robust level. And you can use them throughout our platform, okay, to do all kinds of things to speed your model development. One of the ways you can use them is filtering your inputs, run predictions over all of potentially an unlabeled data source, right? Use a visual classifier or detector to find maybe only the inputs that are relevant to you. So maybe just find the ones that have people in them before deciding that you want to look and see if they have firefighters specifically, right? You can use them to pre-label, okay? There's ways that you can pass those pre-built model uh, predictions to what we call annotation writers. And we'll see a little bit about that today. So I can write very confident predictions as if it's me, myself, labeling that image or that input. We also use it for visual search. So we have this idea of visual embedders that can embed imagery and that's used to represent the image. And then we can actually use that with cluster models to actually perform visual search, either by a known concept of a model or by reverse image search, which are the most similar images to this one. And then uh, finally, we can use transfer learning where we can actually, on top of these really big, robust models, we can train one or two layer models simply on top of those embeddings. We call those a context-based classifier. And that we'll see here in a second rapidly accelerates your model development time. I'm going to be focusing uh, the demo on a specific use case, a uh, real life use case that came to us um, based off of these 18 wheelers or trailer trucks or uh, lorries, whatever you might call it, wherever you wherever in the world you you are. Um, and it turns out these um, can be quite a problem to infrastructure. Uh, transportation infrastructure, especially when they're on roads that are not designed to handle the load. Turns out one 18-wheeler uh, can cause as much damage as 9,600 cars on a road that's not designed for them. So we've been seeing a lot of local law enforcement agencies trying to step up their abilities to enforce these trailer truck restrictions because um, there's real dollar value at stake and um, uh, money to be made um, and saved, essentially. Uh, to this end, we're going to be looking at at least uh, two different approaches that can um, be used to address this problem within our platform. The first we're going to look at is what we like to refer to as a region classification workflow. We're going to see how we can use uh, our pre-built visual vehicle detectors and general embeddings models, okay, along with visual search and bulk labeling to find similar detected regions, label them very quickly, and then we can actually transfer train a custom region classification model on top. So we'll, we'll look at that first. And then we'll go even further to see, could we do what we did in the first approach with just a single class deep trained object detector model all by itself? Uh, we'll look at how we use the region thresholder to filter unlabeled data, that annotation writer to actually write labels uh, and annotations as if it's me, uh, and then actually perform deep training all within the platform. So. Let's go ahead and jump in. How are we doing on time? I'm at 1.14. So we are, um, as I'm going into this, 
our goal is to try to leave the 15 minutes there at the end for the Q&A, and I, I think we, we should be good with that. Um, stepping here into um, the portal, um, I, I need to note, so today's uh, topic is fairly um, advanced, just to be honest, and I, I will be assuming some level of understanding or familiarity with the platform, but I also understand that maybe there's some people on the call today that are seeing our platform for the first time, and that's completely okay, okay? Um, for those uh, who, uh, I'm gonna do my best to try to give like the basic information so you'll understand what's going on, um, but I would direct you to our documentation site, which is proudly overseen by Jeff, the guy who uh, started this, yeah. So um, he's spent a lot of time and effort making this really, um, really a great documentation site. Um, and so I would point you to this as your starting point uh, for learning and, and answering questions that might come up as I'm going through things. Also, like we said, if you do have questions, please do just um, uh, jot them into the comment section here and we'll try to get to them at the end there. Last thing I'll say on the documentation side, everything you're gonna see me do here in the portal uh, can also be done programmatically via our API. We're natively a gRPC API. We, all, we also have a HTTP JSON REST variant as well. Um, we have a number of different uh, clients that wrap this API that are great for developers for actually integrating. This is a, a platform that's designed to be built on top of and integrated into your solutions. Okay. Um, with that said, we can jump in here. So I'm um, inside the front end of our platform that we affectionately refer to as Portal. Um, you'll see each of these represents what we call an application. And I have a few of these built out that we're going to look at. I'm going to start with this first one over here. I don't have enough time and scope today necessarily to go into, like I said, all of the details and everything you're seeing on the screen and all the capabilities here. Okay. Um, but um, the best way to think about an application in our platform is that it's the highest level container, okay? Everything for this specific use case is gonna go inside of this application. All my images are gonna go here. All of my custom concepts and my models I'm gonna build, they're gonna be contained at this application level. When you first start a project, you're typically gonna go over here to uh, what we refer to as the data mode. And you'll see in this case, I use data mode to ingest around 63,597 images into this application. Um, and once you've imported your images here, you can go over into the Explorer view and start to look through that data set. This data set actually came to us from uh, one of the state uh, Department of Transportation themselves. It's actually a publicly available data set. Um, and um, the first thing you'll be thinking when you start getting into these projects is, are there any models that uh, might be available that are gonna jumpstart this process or might solve this you know, problem, uh, make it easier to solve the problem? And when you're asking yourself that question, the best place for you to go typically is to say, okay, does Clarify, or, uh, does Clarify have any pre-trained models that can help with this? There's a few places you can go for this. Outside of the platform, you can go to our, what we call our model gallery, which you, if you go to Google Clarify, uh, and search Clarify model gallery, you should have this result right here. And you can see all these different pre-built models and get examples. You'll see in this use case, we actually have a vehicle model. I can click on it, it'll give me more details here, okay? Uh, so this is good, this looks like a candidate. In the platform, um, there's a few ways you can do it. You can go into model mode, uh, go create a custom workflow. And by the way, workflows are one of the primary ways that we deploy models. Uh, you can add multiple models all together, all kinds of crazy things as you're about to see. Um, so I can go in and I can look at all the clarify models here. I can find the model ID types of detectors and scrub through this and lo and behold, looks like we have a vehicle detector. Could chuck that into this workflow there. And that's exactly what I did. So I can click on uh, any one of these pictures here and I can go to my app workflow and I can specify the vehicle detector workflow. Now what's happening in the background right now is it just grabs that uh, model file, okay? And it um, basically instantiated it and put it up on a, a prediction pod or GPU ready to go. And it took a matter of seconds for it to do that. Okay, so that's some of the, the power of that, that platform that we have underneath this that's handling the deployment. And now we're seeing the actual prediction values here, right? And so, uh, you know, it looks good. Actually, this looks very promising. It's doing all the detections, right? Uh, let's see if we can find maybe an image. 
here. Oh, look. The good news is here, it's doing a really good job It's even capturing those things that are of interest to us, which is um, all those trailer trucks. But unfortunately, it's also capturing a lot of all those other vehicles that we don't care about, right? So the question here now is, how do we only get the trailer trucks that we're actually interested in, okay? Is there any other model that we have available that has knowledge that could be useful for distinguishing and differentiating these trailer trucks from the actual vehicles? And when in doubt, you could go back to the model gallery and see if there's any kind of vehicle type classifier and see if there's anything there. But if you don't find anything when you're searching, I strongly recommend uh, to always just try to see if our general model has any information in there, any knowledge that might be useful for your use case, you'd be pretty surprised. That concept or that, that model, I like to say, is the model that uh, helped build or start the company, right? That's the one that Matt Zeeler won ImageNet 2013 with. Um, it's continued to grow and, and iterate and now covers over 10,000 different concepts trained over millions and millions of images. So it's just got all kinds of great knowledge contained in it, which is really useful uh, in a variety of situations. And that's exactly what I did. So you'll see um, the ability to do this. You could do it right here. Um, you can grab that vehicle detector, which is down here. And then I can pass that to a cropping model, right? So what that's going to do is take each detected region from that detector model. It's actually going to crop them and create, if you can imagine, separate little images from each of those. And then we can actually pass that to the general model itself and get prediction values about what it thinks is in that image, okay? That's exactly what I did here. And you can see that workflow down here, the vehicle detector proper, these generals. Um, I'll note, I did something a little bit even more advanced here, just uh, so you know. Uh, I passed it not only to the general concept model, but we have what we call an embedding model and a cluster model as well. And the embeddings model is going to extract an embedding that's useful for transfer learning against. And then that cluster model is actually going to index all these images in, in the background um, for visual search capabilities. And we're going to see that capability here in a second. But quickly here, I can scrub through and I can go to an image which uh, definitely has a trailer truck in it, like this one. And I can quickly see um, all the predictions down here from the workflow, okay? We see that uh, the vehicle detector found the vehicle, passed it to the cropper, went to the cluster, and then we're going to our general concept model and looking at the concepts of what it thinks of, of this region. And we're in luck. It looks like it knows truck and it knows trailer, right? It even knows this class uh, trailer truck, which is great, or freight or logistics, but there's also noise in here too. So. The point of this is not necessarily to say that you could solve this whole use case by just the combination of these two pre-builds. You could maybe try that, but there's a, a better approach, which is to try to distill the knowledge down through transfer learning. That's really what we're gonna be doing here. And what we know from this concept results is that this is a good candidate model to transfer learn on for this use case, right? That's what we're learning here. It has enough knowledge already contained in that model to where I, uh, I have good confidence that I'll be able to make it be able to distinguish just between between trailer trucks and cars. Okay, so that's exactly what I've done so far. Once this has been put together into a workflow, I can do a really cool um, part, um, which is kind of like feature generation or or maybe pre-labeling if you if you can imagine it. I can set that as what we call a base workflow. Okay. And so what it, that's going to do is it's going to take that workflow that you just saw and it's going to make every single new input that I add into this application, it needs to run through those models, okay? And what, what we're going to do in the background is we're going to store down all of that extracted values, all, those, all that information from those models, and that's going to empower us to do all kinds of new capabilities within this application, okay? So we set that as the custom-based workflow. Now that's going to pre-process all of our images in the application and it's going to enable some cool capabilities. The primary one that it's going to enable us to do is this visual search capability. So you remember I threw that cluster model in there, and now I can actually do search against it. You'll see here in the detection pane that these are the different regions that was detected upon uh, asset ingestion, and we'll see there's this little search with region icon now available. I'll go ahead and click that. And what it's going to do, now it's cropped that image and it's put that here, and it's searching against all of the regions that were extracted when all of these images were added because of that base workflow, okay? And what we're seeing here 
is that these are all the things that it thinks, all these regions that it thinks looks like this trailer truck because um, it, it knows, generally speaking, what visual similarity means from a contextual understanding. And from here, I can very quickly go in. You can see that these are the actual regions here, how I'm uh, altering this mode. I can zoom in here if you really want to see. I'm altering between going the full image and then zooming into the actual region. So we're, we're clear that this is actually doing the regions. And then from here, and this is exactly what I did, I can grab a, uh, a group of them and uh, very quickly do bulk labeling, label that as selection, and I can say trailer truck. Okay. And that's exactly what I did. And um, I did that for the trailer truck, and then I grabbed a few examples of a few cars, did a few searches on those, grabbed a group of those, labeled those as non-trailer truck. And then from there, once you have just a small set of data uh, that's labeled pretty quickly, you can go ahead and actually create a, a, a little classification model that's going to work on top of those regions. You can go into the create model. This is in the model mode here. I click on context-based classifier here, and I can set up, um, you know, my concepts, trailer truck, non-trailer truck, give it a name, set some of the output configs, very simple, easy to do. Um, you'll see here that I've already done this step, and this is the active model that I created, and you'll see here that the 459 uh, non-trailer trucks were labeled and 353 trailer trucks were. It was as easy from here to just go ahead and say train model, okay? And that's going to be all trained in the background. You're going to see this is going to work very, very quickly. Um, that's because all of those embeddings are pre-computed, grabs those from the database, and then quickly transfer learns a one or two layer uh, kind of uh, classification model from there. Uh, I can see once I've trained that model, I can throw that into, for example, uh, the workflow, any workflow. You'll see right here, this workflow here, I've gone ahead and I've added my vehicle classification um, model to this workflow here. And now when I scroll down, what we're gonna see is the predictions coming here. And now it's able to distinguish trailer truck versus non-trailer truck. And I can show you on the screen here if you'd like to see. And I can filter out these and those. And now you can see clearly the 0.99 trailer truck and 1.0 trailer truck. We can also see quickly um, the eval. So, uh, we store every single version of a model that, um, sorry, every single version of a model that you'll train. Uh, if you go to the model details and you go to the evaluate page here, you'll see every single version is preserved. It tells me that I've trained an initial model with 200, and this was my rock ox score. And then you can do evals very quickly. I love uh, a lot of the things on, on this screen. I don't have time to go into too much detail, but as a former data scientist, I can tell you it's really nice to have the evals all built in here with your confusion matrices and being able to look through the exact uh, uh, concepts that are having problems and, and really understand what's going on visually, which is really important for computer vision. But it's important to note, regardless of that, um, we're getting very good uh, performance and accuracy out of this little transfer learn model very quickly. So I, I did very little. Um, labeling necessary here, trained a quick little model, and we're already getting pretty good results. Um, okay, so uh, I want to just quickly summarize what we saw there, okay, um, in that section. We were able to set up a custom-based workflow for our application that allowed us to detect all uh, vehicle objects, and then we indexed all of those regions by their general appearance characteristics, which then enabled me to use search inside of the application to find all the trailer trucks and non-trailer trucks and quickly label them, okay? So I went from zero to about 800 labeled examples pretty darn quick. And then I was able to chuck in a little transfer learn classifier model and then even start to look at some of those evaluations. Okay, that's great. Now, let's see if we can actually even go a step further, okay? So from here, the question is what we just achieved is there a way this this will work and it'll work pretty pretty well but it has to to do it it has to look at every single region in the in the actual prediction and then pass those each to a classification model is there a more efficient way to do that could we train it all into a single model so i went into the separate uh, application here uh, just to keep things a little bit separate but i i duplicated the previous application to keep working from it okay and I did some clever things to take it to kind of the next level. So you'll see here when I go into this um, 
this particular image um, and I'm going to go down to the workflow. You're going to see, let's go to this one here. So this is the same workflow that I showed you before. We still have the vehicle detector. We're still going to threshold this and we're still going to crop it out and pass it to our little transfer learned vehicle classifier. But we added two new uh, models here at the end that do some, some unique things. The first one's what we call a region thresholder model, okay? And what this is, just imagine it as a filter, okay? And it's gonna filter out all of the prediction values that are lower than a certain threshold. In this case, I chose 50, okay? And what I, why I did that is I put an annotation writer after it, which is going to write all of the, the regions that pass to this model as if it's me, okay? So by doing that, I can actually, and uh, I, I can go back to my application, and you can see here there's this edit button, right? So in the previous app, I had a certain workflow that was just indexing it, but I switched it out with this one with the new annotation writer, and then I did a really cool thing where I re-indexed the entire application. So it took all those 60,000 images and ran it right back through that base workflow, okay? And the benefit of that is now every single thing that it's learned is a trailer truck from that classifier model that's over 50%, it's gonna write as an annotation as if it was me doing it. And so what you can see down here, if you can see this, this is now 5,938 total annotations that were written. So if you remember before we had around 400 and now we've done 10X the amount. And essentially, once again, I haven't drawn a single bounding box in this entire exercise myself, right? I hate drawing bo bounding boxes. And if you're a data scientist like me, you've got a PhD, uh, nothing irks you more than spending most of your time reading uh, or, or drawing bounding boxes. So this is what we talk about when we talk about semi-supervised or kind of automated labeling. From here, once I have that corpus of around 6,000 images, um, I can go ahead and use the platform to train a uh, deep train we call deep training by the way is our own our own jargon for when we're training an entire graph so um, training the entire graphs weights and go in and find a visual detector here i can add the trailer truck class to do a single class detector which is what we're interested in here i don't have the scope today to go into a lot of the details um, uh, on setting up the training of these these deep train models um, all I can say is that we've really focused to make this as uh, approachable and um, uh, focused as possible um, for any type of user and um, to allow for more functionality for more advanced users, especially using the API. So even though um, there's only a few templates to choose from here um, for different architectures available and a few hyperparameters. And by the way, all this is once again documented, all these and there's tool tips and then you can find more documentation that Jeff has put into the actual documentation here. Um, there's even more functionality in the API as well. So you can set even more hyperparameters and even more output and training config. So uh, just know that all that's really contained, but it's as easy as going ahead and, and creating this model in here, which I've already done. That is my trailer truck detector that I created here. Um, I can go ahead and do the same thing where I hit train. I don't have to set up the runtime. I don't have to you know, provision workers. This is all going to be handled by our managed training cluster. It'll go to the next available training worker and handle all of that. Once it's trained, once again, you can see all the versions that have been trained and we do version control and your versions will persist. Um, we'll see here that we do evaluations within the platform as well. And you can go in here and start to do those. Um, you can see we had a, a mean average precision Rockox score here of 0.96 over the, um, the test set. So uh, fairly accurate um, model already after only about 6,000 uh, examples being provided. And just to uh, verify that this thing does actually do what I'm saying that it does, we can step into one of these images here and we can see uh, where we were before. We were somewhere roughly here before, if you remember, where we were drawing bounding boxes around everything, right? See all those bounding boxes there with the vehicle detector. And then we had a classifier that was able to find just the trailer trucks. And now we've distilled this down to a specialist model, a single model all by itself here now in this one here, which now is drawing a single bounding box around just the trailer truck by itself, okay? so. I hope all of that um, uh, set in. We we're, we're want to move quickly here so we can actually get to the Q&A on time. 
A uh, quick review here before I hand it back over to Jeff. So we started from where we were before, having that region classification workflow. And then we actually added a region threshold or an annotation writer, which allowed us to filter only the confident uh, prediction values and then auto write them as if it was me labeling them. From there, I was able to quickly configure a deep training uh, model uh, with all the hyperparameters and submit the training job, the deep training job to our managed training cluster. Now, I'm going to hand it back over to Jeff, who will give you the exciting kind of results. Jeff, are you there? I am here. Excellent. Thanks so much, Trey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I, I'm just going to make some high level comments to sort of uh, uh, review a little bit about, about what we've uh, seen here. Hopefully, you're excited about what we just showed us. We are. Um, what we saw is a process that we've seen our customers struggle with for days uh, to weeks, actually, um, uh, you know, building a custom. Uh, uh, detector like this, and we, we were able to accomplish it in just a matter of hours uh, with training and deployment itself as easy as a click of a button. Um, and so let's go through some of these key takeaways. Uh, so if you caught this, you may have been surprised. And if you didn't, I certainly think it's worth calling out. Um, the transfer learn model was able to get uh, a real high level of accuracy performance with just 439 uh, training inputs. And this is less than 10% of the data that was required to train our deep train model. And it took uh, uh, 100 times less time to train the model. Uh, next slide. And uh, But the next thing we would want to take a look at is uh, the prediction performance. And in this, we can see the deep train model performed much more quickly and made much more efficient use of our computing resources. Uh, the deep trained object detector um, offered an inference through, throughput that was uh, over four times higher, and uh, median latency was less than the, a third of what we saw in the transfer train model. Um, and I think it's easy to get an intuitive sense of why this would be the case, uh, looking at the images on the right-hand side. Uh, the transfer train model was part of a broader workflow uh, that simply had more steps, uh, detected vehicles, cropped them, classified them. And the deep train model's inference pipeline was much simpler, just included one model. Um, so in that first photo on the top, you can see uh, the transfer learning workflow at work, uh, detected dozens of vehicles on the road, um, and ran each vehicle through a classification workflow. And then the second photo, the deep train models only uh, detected trailer trucks, and it doesn't care about the other kinds of vehicles. And um, since we're avoiding a workflow for each detection, we're also able to avoid those additional steps um, of detecting and cropping and thresholding and classifying the vehicles. Uh, yeah, and then um, finally, uh, so you may be tempted to make some pre preliminary conclusions uh, that there are certain solutions, uh, certain situations where a transfer train model may work better than a deep train model. Uh, for example, if you don't have a lot of labeled data uh, or you're limited, limited in your computing resources, uh, it, uh, in this case, a transfer learning approach may be much more efficient. And conversely, um, you may conclude that a deep train model be, would be best when you've got lots of labeled data and lots of GPU resources are not an issue. And while this may be true, uh, we would suggest a different conclusion. Um, and that's that both of these approaches are highly complementary. Um, so you can use a transfer train model to quickly get you up and running auto annotate a single uh, significant amount of your data and then use that label data to create your deep train model. And also remember in this example, uh, they, they were, uh, these models were created using zero manually uh, label, uh, labeled uh, inputs. So, um, so at the highest level, we use the, a general model, a generalist model uh, to power a teacher, um, and our region classifier workflow that was used to help automatically specialize the model, the deep trained object detector. And the transfer learning, learning model dramatically accelerated uh, the development of this high performance model. 
and um, both these models work hand in hand and Clarify's ability to uh, build these complementary capabilities truly distinguishes um, our platform and creates uh, hopefully immense value for my customers. Um, and with that, uh, we would like to conclude the presentation by uh, passing the mic back over to Trey and um, answer any questions that you uh, may have sent in. Thank you there, Jeff. Um, so we're trying to sort through, looks like there's quite a bit of things um, being put into the chat. So trying to quickly get to as many of those as possible. Um, first, as far as um, tutorial or documentation, uh, main source is still going to be the, the main documentation site that I showed. And then increasingly, we're having um, more and more content going on to our YouTube channel. Uh, maybe if Jeff um, you want to post that link into the chat real quick. Um, that would be a secondary source there. Um, those are your primary uh, uh, outlets there. And if that doesn't suffice reaching out to the sales team, um, uh, we have all kinds of different options available um, as part of kind of our um, for enterprise kind of clients. We offer all kinds of different training programs and all kinds of things. So you could reach out for more help with that. Okay. Let's see what other questions are uh, I can quickly address. Um, customized models, which are defined, uh, can we know the architecture and uh, needed configuration? So um, once again, you'll have to, there, there's a section about deep training in the documentation site um, that goes into some of this here. Um, aside from what's available uh, there, uh, there's not much more information about a lot of our architectures that we use are proprietary, so we don't release too much information about those ones. Um, moving forward into the end of this year, early next year, we will allow for um, uh, importing certain of your own external models. Um, so that's something to, to look forward to there, so you can um, bring your models um, into the platform with your own architectures um, as well. So that's all on the roadmap. Um, let's see, um, always camera is placed up front, i.e. front view only, is that the case, will not be, no whether the truck, so uh, it might just be I was showing you uh, examples where the, the camera was in front, but um, actually that model, um, all kinds of examples were passed to the detector from all different angles, so that detector model does pretty well, it generalizes over trailer trucks from almost any angle, it even included uh, imagery at nighttime of, of trailer trucks. So um, it was actually a pretty darn decent um, detector model for the limited amount of um, uh, labor that actually went into training it. Okay. Uh, trying to keep going here. Um, can I run the model uh, or train models in my local system? Uh, so at this time, uh, there is no capability to export any models trained. Uh, part of that is, like I said, uh, those models um, that we that we make available are running our own proprietary um, uh, architectures at this time. So we don't allow those to be exported out the full model files. Um, as we move into allowing for importing of any kind of custom model or specifying your own model architectures, um, that is something we are looking to be able to allow. So that will be likely on the roadmap here um, for non-proprietary models trained in our platform. Um, so um, that's something to look forward to as well. Um, okay, I'm gonna keep going here. What are the data formats when training the model with new data? So uh, the nice piece about uh, our platform is, for the most part, you don't have to deal with data formatting and having to deal with it. If you label in the platform, stays in the platform, a lot of that nitty gritty is happening in the back end there. As far as what data format, if you have pre-labeled data that you need to bring into the platform, there's documentation within the documentation on how you can make API calls, which you can add and ingest images with the annotation data, okay? So all that's pretty well documented and, and, and for, uh, even a novice kind of, of coder um, should be able to, to quickly be able to use that to ingest um, data with your pre-labeled data formats there. So all that all that's documented, um, uh, clients available, Python, Java, Node.js, C-sharp, PHP. So 
Um, hopefully there's a, a language there of choice. There's there's new languages coming out soon with Swift. Um, Jeff, are there any ones I'm thinking I'm missing on that? Any upcoming new ones? Uh, specific clients on the roadmap you're saying? Swift is the main one that's about to oh, release. The most recent, yeah. Yeah, okay. So that, that's your main way of um, uh, ingesting data there. And um, similarly, actually, you can find documentation in the platform as well. You can actually use API endpoints to get those annotations back out. And you can see examples of how that data comes back out in JSON format. Uh, it's honestly pretty similar, honestly, to uh, if anyone's aware of uh, the COCO uh, JSON data formatting. So uh, the common objects uh, uh, library there, pretty, pretty similar to that formatting. Okay, moving along, we have a few other questions. I was asking about the exporting uh, of that question, so I hope I answered that um, for you as well. Thank you, uh, Anders, for the compliment on the great presentation. Thank you, guys. Uh, let's see. Um, how do you evaluate the performance of the annotation model? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, today we only really focused on a, a truly um, automated uh, fashion of doing this and it was kind of honestly cherry picked uh, a little bit on our end on a, a, a use case where it was very visually distinct and, and we knew it'd be relatively uh, good uh, it, it would be easy to train the model because it's not a huge amount of complexity and very uh, nuanced there are situations and, and we're likely going to do another webinar probably we're looking at maybe next month um, where we'll show how you're going to be able to combine what we were showing today but instead of automatically writing those labels as if it was me instead write them to what we call a labeling task where a reviewer is going to go look and have the last say to verify and we can combine this a little bit with another uh, cool feature with ai assist that that's built into um, the labeler view. Um, we, we showed a little bit of this on our Perceive conference about a month ago. Um, so um, maybe some people on this call already saw that, but we'll having we'll, we'll likely be having a more in-depth uh, look at that. That 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 starts to achieve what what is sometimes referred to as human in the loop labeling capabilities, um, kind of augmenting your um, human workforce to to limit them to only the the most important pieces they need to focus on. Okay, so I hope um, I answered that question there. Um, can we use custom trained models when there is no network connectivity? Um, and so uh, before I answer that question, I realize uh, we're starting to go over on time. We're at 1.46. Um, I think um, I'm going to try to just quickly answer any of the rest of the questions that were asked before 1.45. I'm sorry. Um, if you have other questions, we can um, maybe set up, a, Jeff, a communication channel. Um, if there's maybe an email address that you want to jot into the, um, the chat box there where they can uh, funnel any of their questions, that would be great. Um, while he's maybe getting an email address to put into the chat box for that, um, uh, I'll go back to that question. Can we use the custom train model when there's no network? So to deploy models uh, outside of our cloud deployment uh, platform, um, that gets into edge capabilities. Um, we already have the beginnings of that capability um, that's available to enterprise uh, customers at the moment. If you have a particular use case and are interested in working with us on actually getting some of these models deployed, we do lots of edge deployments with, uh, especially on our public sector side of the business, uh, deploying onto um, remotely deployed, uh, even remote servers, edge servers, as well as getting into actually deploying on uh, kind of drones and, and all kinds of um, individual device sensors and, and low power. Um, we will be releasing a, uh, a full edge suite, uh, likely early uh, Q1 or late Q1 into early Q2 next year that we'll start uh, rolling these capabilities out to more of the, the general um, user base. So all of that is very exciting and, and coming soon. So um, stay uh, tuned for updates on that. Okay, um, I think maybe I've gotten to all the questions. Uh, let's see, let me make sure. So if we are making our own custom model. Uh, there was one question I missed. Uh, so if we are making our own custom model, we have to manually label each image that we 
are using in our own data sets, right? Uh, so the, basically, if you're creating your own model, you're always always going to need uh, label data. That's the whole premise of supervised learning, right? We need to have some target that it needs to learn from, uh, the foundation there of supervised learning. Uh, and this webinar today was uh, showing some approaches to make use of pre-trained models, which will radically accelerate and automate the labeling of that data in a strategic way. Sometimes we refer to that as semi-supervised learning approaches. Um, there's also methods if you have your data pre-labeled um, to use the API to ingest that as well. So I hope that answered that question. Okay, I think that's it. Jeff, did you have any other uh, parting remarks? Well, I would just like to thank everybody for joining us. It's been our pleasure to present and uh, we would be happy to help with any additional questions you've got. I put uh, an email in the uh, the the uh, chat uh, here and, and it's just support at clarify.com. It's a great resource. Excellent. So if uh, anybody has any other questions, you can go ahead and uh, email them there. Otherwise, we really appreciate you guys joining and there will be, we'll, we'll make sure to send out a recording to everybody who RSVP'd for this event. Thank you all so much and have a great day.